Okay, well, in fact, the very first thing I'm going to talk about is exactly <laughs> that, uh, that piece of work. Okay, so thank you very much indeed for the uh, invitation here. It's always worth the trip upon the, across the pond to come to an interesting workshop. So I'm going to be talking about some uh, very recent work that's going on at the moment at Leeds uh, on simultaneously learning and grounding object features and spatial relationships. Almost all the work and research I do has got something to do with spatial information, whether it's to do with tunnel maintenance, cognitive vision, detecting archaeological residues from hyperspectral imagery, um, or robotics. So, as I say, I'm going to start off with a, little bit, a, little, a few bits of earlier work um, at Leeds, and then the main part of the talk will be this uh, ongoing work on simultaneously learning and grounding object features and spatial relationships. So, uh, as um, Andre said, uh, the, there was some work we did about 10 years ago now, which uh, what we tried to do was to try to learn, uh, observe humans playing games, and then learn um, the, essentially the, the rules of the games, uh, not how to play it well, but just uh, the mechanics of the state-to-state -state transformations. And the training data for this was uh, spoken utterances. There wasn't actually a language model. It was just the sounds which we clustered to form utterance classes. Uh, and so in this particular game, which was kind of a uh, card version of rock, paper, scissors, and uh, so we had two different kind of cards representing the three, uh, sorry, three different cards representing the three different objects. And then we put the cards down and then say win, play, lose, draw, and so forth. And here you can see, actually, this is going <laughs> to... So you can see there's a... Um, there's a talking head up there, which is now, um, now recognizing the situation and then uh, it's describing what, what um, the state of play at the moment, whether it's an empty uh, table, in which case it says uh, play, or it recognizes whether it's a win or a lose for the player on the left. So... Um, the, what, it did, what it did was to learn uh, rules using an inductive logic programming system. And um, in, in black here, you can see uh, the actual kind of uh, ILP systems, all the kind of English translations of them. And uh, this is actually not for that game. It's for a slightly, a slightly different game, uh, a simplified version of a game called Uno, where you had cards of either the same shape or the same color. And it had to learn, um, the, again, the rules of whether to say the same color, same shape, or neither. And uh, it was able to learn the concept of equality without using seeing all instances of all equal objects. But the key point of, of this work from this point of uh, today's uh, workshop is that this was unsupervised learning of colors and shapes uh, without knowing their names. In this case, we weren't grounding uh, the, the names of the shapes and colors, but we were grounding the utterances to the game states, which then involved. And here you can see these sort of things in square brackets are uh, the, the different objects here, there's two different objects, and they've got a particular color and a particular shape. Okay, so that was, uh, as I say, work about 10 years ago. Um, almost all the work I kind of do, as I said, has got something to do with spatial information. In particular, a lot of my work has got to do with uh, quality of spatial information, and quality of uh, temporal information. And there's this uh, so-called reach and connection calculus, or RCC8, which I've been uh, particularly worked on. And uh, here you can see the eight relationships of the region connection calculus. Uh, and here we have disconnected, externally connected, partially overlapping, two different proper part relationships, tangential and non-tangential, their inverses and equality. Uh, typically, for most vision work, it's better to use a simplified version of that where we ignore the tangency relationships. And so we get this version called RCC5. But of course, that's not the only kind of qualitative uh, spatial relationships you might want to have. You might want to have uh, directions. There's lots of different uh, quality direction calculi. After the literature, maybe here's one with just four distinctions, upper left, upper right, down left, down right. But there's lots of other ones. Relative speed, relative size, uh, the so-called qualitative directory calculus you see illustrated on the right, which tells you about whether two objects are moving in the same direction, opposite directions, one static. They're moving towards each other and away from each other. So I say there's a lot of these calculi out there, and uh, here's one piece of work um, which 
and the most recent incarnation of it uh, appeared in JIR earlier this year. And again, this is using inductive logic programming to learn rules, which you see up here. This is applied to uh, airport video data collected at Toulouse Airport. This is uh, gate 40 at Toulouse Airport. Uh, and we had partners who did uh, tracking of objects for us. And then we learned rules from that. And this, this tracking data was pretty noisy. And uh, the, we were then had to, we tried to learn the various different IR to specified uh, events such as aircraft arrival, ground power unit arrival, which is what you can see here. And then eventually our aircraft's going to come in and it recognizes that. And all these rules being displayed at the top left, which you probably can't see, but it's essentially using RCC5 to describe the relationship between the objects and the zones on the ground. Okay. So uh, that was one application of quality spatial uh, representation and reasoning uh, in video uh, activity understanding. Uh, one particular for, uh, reason put forward by people working in QSR uh, and the reason being interested in is that our, spatial lang our natural language is predominantly spatial. When we talk about the people in this room, the bottle is on the table, the water is in the bottle, uh, and so forth. Um, the projector is in the middle of the room, I'm at the front of the room. We predominantly we, we use uh, qualitative spatial relationships and qualitative spatial language to describe everyday uh, relationships of how the world is. Uh, and we've, the community has invented all these different calculi, some of which I displayed on the previous slide. Uh, and there's been some work uh, gone on to, to, to try to uh, test how cognitively valid these calculi are. I, are the distinctions made in these qualitative calculi the same ones as human beings tend naturally to make? And generally speaking, they are, but maybe not always. And so there's an argument that says, well, actually, well, maybe we should actually try to learn the quality of uh, calculi from language. And also, in particular, if we then learn it from both language and vision, we can then try to actually learn the, um, the distinctions, the metric distinctions of when to describe uh, a, a scenario as being in one spatial relationship and when another. Because most of the work in quality spatial representation has actually ignored that uh, link going from the real world, from vision, from perception, uh, to actually the qualitative abstraction. And there's another issue there, which again is to do with, uh, I already mentioned RCC5, RCC8. There's these different calculi at different levels of description. How do we know what's the right level of uh, relational granularity? So uh, some work which appeared in the AAAI Spring Symposium last year, where we then uh, try to use spatial relationships to ground uh, or objects. So supposing you've got a scene such as the one on the right, a, um, a place setting there, and supposing we've magically actually managed to uh, distinguish the different objects uh, on the place setting, but we don't know what they are. We don't know that these are called plates and knives and forks and serviettes and so forth. But we've got bounding boxes for each of those. Suppose we then go to WikiHow and get a description of how to learn, uh, of how to set a place uh, setting. So we get uh, something like this, and so it says set the dinner plate uh, in front of the chair. That's in black because we don't have the chair in here. But all the bits in color relate to stuff we can actually see in the picture here. Um, place the drinking glass on the right-hand side of the plate, add the dinner plate, uh, on, add to the dinner plate a napkin placed in the center, and so forth. And so the idea is uh, for each of those bits of text on the left there, we're now going to uh, create a quality spatial representation in, in a quality spatial formalism, which then uh, is a representation of the text on the left. This is actually done manually at the moment. Uh, we'd like to do this automatically, but that doesn't appear in that uh, IIII Spring Symposium paper. So now we have the, the quality spatial description on the right. So now we can abstract that to a relational graph where each node represents one of the objects, and we have uh, arcs linking uh, different objects if there's a spatial relationship between them. So each of these arcs here is labeled one of the, by one of the spatial relationships, such as left, on, above, below, whatever. And then we also have the, the actual scene, perceptual scene with the objects. And each one of the uh, nodes on the graph on the right corresponds to one of the objects. We don't know what they are. These are just objects one through nine. Uh, but again, we've got spatial relationships which we can compute between each of the objects, and this is now a, a, clique, a, a nine clique, uh, which is, of course, much sparser than 
uh, sorry, this is now much sparse than here. In language, we don't describe typically the spatial relationship between every pair of objects. We give much less information. So now there's the question of can we uh, match these two graphs, from, uh, uh, the, the, the graph extracted from the text and the graph extracted from vision, and use that to actually ground the, 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 the words on the left to the uh, objects on the right. And so we have a, a similarity uh, me uh, metric where we, uh, we first of all match individual nodes, one node in the left graph with one node on the right, based on the similarity of the arcs coming out of each of the uh, nodes. And then we iteratively do that by taking, we've now got the first level similarity computed for every node, and we can iteratively do that, uh, taking account of the, the similarities of the neighbors and the neighbors of the neighbors, until eventually we get a complete similarity matrix and then we use a Hungarian algorithm to determine the best node matching. And then this tells us that basically the, the better the graph similarity we see on the x-axis there, uh, we get a higher fraction of objects recovered here uh, on the y-axis. So this was the, uh, the, the actual, because that picture we saw was, it was from the WikiHow page, and so this is a correct natural language description of the image. But even if we take a different natural language description, which isn't of that, it may have additional objects, uh, maybe missing objects, different relationships, we're still able to uh, recover, as we increase the graph similarity measure, we're able to uh, recover a, a quite a good fraction of, of, the, uh, of the objects and essentially ground the language to, to, to the percep perceptual objects. So uh, it doesn't have to be the, 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 the same text. Exactly. Okay, so, so you're assuming the system knows what left, right, and right off means. So in this, exactly. So it doesn't know what the opposite is. Exactly, means. exactly. So in that, in that work, it's a lovely lead into the next bit of the talk. Uh, so in that, it knows what left off and right off mean, uh, but we don't know. We're then using that knowledge to ground, uh, to, to figure out, you know, this is a fork and that's a spoon and that's a plate, okay? So now we'd like to actually... Uh, learn what left off and right off mean. We'd like to learn uh, what uh, to the left off means. We'd like to learn what far means. We'd like to learn what close means. Uh, we'd also like to learn things like big and small and red and green and purple. So uh, the goal is to design and implement a system that's capable of uh, learning the meanings of words, updating its up physical understanding of the surrounding environment, focus on spatial language, not exclusively because I want to learn colors as well, uh, objects and object features. But critically, we've got no knowledge of word meanings or of grammar, so I'm, I'm not going to pass sentences, uh, but again, I'm going to assume ob object seg segmentation, so I'm not trying to solve the object segmentation problem. So this is ongoing work, not yet published. Uh, so there's two main aspects uh, to this problem uh, in terms of matching uh, words to, 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 to the scene. The, um, we, we've got various different feature spaces, such as the feature space for color. We're going to use HSV space. We've got distance between objects, which is um, some sort of, sort of me metric space measured in it's whatever scale you want to use. Uh, directions from one object to the other. So you've got a particular object, and it's going to be to the seen from the robot's perspective, to the left, to the right, above, below, and so forth. And now the question is, which of the words, remember it's not being parsed, so we've just got essentially this bag of words, or maybe it's just a sequence of words, uh, correspond to which feature spaces. So is red a color word, or is it a distance word? Uh, and some of them may not correspond to anything like the and of and an. Uh, and also there's the question of we've got these continuous feature spaces, and I want to be able to discretize them and match uh, words to the different subspaces, discretized subspaces. So that's the problem I'm trying to set. So determine that red is a color, and it corresponds to a particular uh, subregion of HSV space. So here's the training data. So for this work, uh, we just took a synthetic data set. We had a, a model of uh, the different spatial relationships and of colors. And then we've generated 250 training samples that looks like uh, here, four instances from that. And you can see we've got different colors. I think there's uh, we've got a total of 16 color words, four distance words, eight direction words. We could also have other features such as size and texture and weight. Uh, there's about 40 occurrences of each color word, uh, more than 100 of each distance word, and between 60 and 80 of each direction word. Uh, in these particular examples, we've got complete descriptions of every pair of between every pair of objects. Doesn't have to be the case; it still works, uh, though it might take a little bit more training data uh, 
if you don't have all pairwise object uh, relationships. So in terms of the architecture of the system, we have the uh, image and scene descriptions. We have these uh, pairs. We have a scene, and we have a description of it. Uh, and we, from the scene, we compute the particular uh, HSV value that's present for the different objects in it, the particular distances between all pairs of objects, the, the, relationship, the direction relationships uh, in, in terms of an angle from each object to each other object. Uh, we also extract uh, the words from the sentences. Then for each word, uh, we dynamically update its, its uh, word feature histogram, which basically, it says here, uh, basically for each word, we then compute for each feature space, color, distance, etc., uh, all the different values it's seen in some scene. It's seen in some S-E-E-N, in some scene, S-E-E-N, E, -E -E -E, uh, in, all the, in all the scenes. And then as we go through, so it's incrementally with each new scene, it updates its model. And it will uh, up, then, using a statistical consistency algorithm, which I'll describe on the next slide, it tries to uh, associate tr uh, and determine exactly this question we have on the, uh, this hit the bottom of this page. Uh, you know, the red is a color, and it corresponds to a particular region of HSV space. Uh, and then there's this knowledge consolidation algorithm which I'll talk about in a moment and which will need to, uh, to actually uh, learn um, asymmetric um, uh, relationships. So every word has got a histogram of bucketed values, uh, col color, distance, um, direction, and so forth. Every time a word is mentioned, its histogram is updated with all seen feature values. And then what we want to do is to look for statistical consistency between the number of times a word is mentioned and the values of the histograms of its different features. And hopefully you should then see that the RED will then be associated uh, mostly with a particular subset of HSV space rather than with direction uh, or anything else. Uh, and so what we're doing is we search. Remember, we don't have a pre-segmented uh, um, space. We don't have pre-segmented feature spaces, so we have to segment them. And we're going to do that by looking for the smallest convex region in each feature space, which contains most of the word occurrences if any such reason exists. Some words aren't color or distance or um, direction words. And we have a restriction on the maximum size of the region. Otherwise, of course, we could just take the whole of the feature space. And so the resulting hypothesis is essentially Gaussian models that connect words to a subset of a feature space. So this kind of gives you an idea. Uh, you can see the scene number as we get more and more uh, scenes, where our hypothesis then evolve. And so you can see this is a three-dimensional HSV space. In the middle, we've got distance. and the right, we've got direction. As we can see that as we go through the different scenes, we're getting better and better models. So that as we get to the end, we've now got a nice direction model with eight different uh, directions. Uh, it might be easier to see that um, looking at each of the feature, uh, feature spaces individually. So here's color. Here's after 10 scenes. It's a little bit confused. It's got bottom left in there, for example. It thinks that might be a color. Um, th things aren't very well clustered. It's getting better after 100 scenes. And after 250 scenes, all the colors are nicely clustered and assigned to um, uh, an appropriate subpart of HSV space. For uh, distance, again, after 10 scenes, it's a bit confused. It's maybe the and of and top right and is might be uh, distances but it's getting better after 100 scenes. And by after 250 scenes, you can see it's got a nice um, model here of, of distance in terms of near being, uh, so close being in the center, the closest distances to the middle of the uh, space uh, going out to um, um, was it near, very, near, very far, uh, far and close. And then finally, in the middle here, we've got a relative direction where again, after 10 scenes, it's pretty confused. Uh, but after 250 scenes, we've got a very nice model of top left, top left, bottom left, and so forth. So uh, the problem comes with um, trying to learn uh, particularly asymmetric relationships like left off. So because if we don't know, if I say red object is the left of the blue object, I don't, unless I know which is the red object and which is the blue object, I don't know which way around to, um, to, to actually take the direction. So it's very hard to learn direction until we have some notion of actually which object is which in the scene. So uh, here the idea is that we have objects down the bottom here, and then here the different features such as um, 
color and size and so forth, which we can learn initially. And we now the idea is we've learned that blue is a particular part of HSV space, and similarly red is another part of HSV space. And we've, there's going to be some relationship between O1 and O2. And the question is which of these words then here correspond to that relationship. Uh, but because we've now mapped, uh, got, got a, a grounding for red and blue, we can then use that. Uh, and so the system then feeds that via this so-called knowledge consolidation algorithm. I should say that the, we do assume, the only part of the grammar that we assume is this, is that we assume a kind of subject verb object or an ob uh, object verb subject uh, model of language. I assume that it's something left of something rather than something something left of. Uh, so the, 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 the relationship has to be in the middle of the two objects it applies to. Um, and here you can see the effect of, of using this knowledge consolidation algorithm where as we get object hypotheses for uh, color um, confirmed, uh, we get good, good hypotheses for colors, we can use that to start learning um, direction uh, and, and distance. And here you can see that with and without the KCA, it doesn't make much difference. We get just about the same uh, level of performance. Uh, with a distance isn't too bad, but here you can see for direction, as you might expect, without this feedback, we really don't do very well at all for direction. But with uh, this knowledge, cons cons knowledge consolidation algorithm, it actually works pretty well. Okay, so a little demo uh, using our Baxter robot. Uh, how many throughout Baxter robots are there? Do you say 3,000 Baxter robots now? We heard earlier on today. Um, 300. Oh, well. Or any other order magnitude out. I thought 3,000 sounded a lot. So, um, so this is now using the, so we're using the, the learning from what I just showed you from that synthetic data set applied to uh, this, this real environment. Uh, we've got object detection using uh, um, a connect light camera, which is attached uh, additionally to the, uh, to the Baxter. Uh, here we've got uh, some cups. The, the language part of this is actually hard-coded. So it, it, this is said, touch the black cup or the black object. So it knows what touch means. We haven't learned that. That's the next part of the, what we want to do. Uh, but the black, the black object, it, it, that part is learned. Uh, touch the blue object below the black object. So again, it knows we've hard-coded touch. But bl blue object below the black object, that's what it's learned from the previous um, the, the synthetic data set. In the top right there, you can see the, the Baxter viewpoint of what it's seeing through its uh, RPG camera. And this has touched the blue object from the, far from the black object. And again, it's, it's doing that fine. OK. So as I say, this is ongoing work. It's still very preliminary. Um, it's, this domain is still pretty simple. Um, there's a lack of noise in, in the training data. It's still fairly small scale. Obviously, we want to be able to deal with real, um, with, with real training data, not just synthetic data, where there's bound to be noise. Uh, we'll probably have to learn some kind of grammar. We're looking at using a dependency grammar, uh, particularly to handle issues like negation and multi-word <coughs> descriptions. If you are very observant, you'll have noticed that things like very far and top left were, weren't two words. It was actually top underscore left and very underscore far. So it was a, it was, uh, we cheated and made it one word. So we, we need to be able to handle multi-word um, dis uh, um, feature descriptions. Uh, and in particular, as I mentioned, we'd like to be able to learn actions and events. So rather than just having a single uh, static scene, we'd like to have a pair of scenes or a whole video and having a description of that video and be able to learn not only the words uh, and, and the spatial relationships, but also the events as well. So one particular thing we're looking at at the moment is uh, a robot command data set taken from the semi-val uh, 14 uh, challenge. Uh, we've added some additional animation to that. So that's a 1,000 different scenes. There's 7,769 7, commands which were done by Amazon Turk. Uh, and so here's uh, a selection of some of the scenes. These are um, a robot trying to place, given the command, it's supposed to move a particular bot. Um, object from one place to another. And uh, here's just one particular scene two, and here are the various different Amazon Turk descriptions of scene two. So what we'd like to be able to do is to take these Amazon Turk uh, descriptions 
and then be able to do what I've just talked about in the early part of this talk, uh, but using this and, and, and that little video. Okay, so the particular challenge of this semi-val data set seems much more complex, how to focus attention uh, on the particular uh, objects uh, which are most ap apposite to the, to the text. Uh, do we actually have enough training data there? Uh, some of those Amazon search descriptions are pretty bad. They're not necessarily unique. They're ambiguous. Uh, lots of variations of commands to actually achieve the actions. Okay, thank you. Any questions? <coughs>